Balls Mahoney! This is Behind the Bastards, the podcast where every week we celebrate famed wrestler Balls Mahoney, uh, who whose career started in the late 80s and ran through the 90s before his tragic death at age 44 of a heart attack. Here to talk about Balls Mahoney, Margaret Kiljoy, Garrison Davis. How are y'all doing? How are we feeling about, about Balls? Balls Mahoney. This show has really changed in scope since last time I've been on, huh? I am um, very excited about this person that I totally believe is a real person. Regrettably, oh, it is. It is, is a real not person. A podcast mm-hmm. because all of our faces Mm-mm. were like, oh, mm-hmm. Robert. Because y'all aren't y'all aren't pilled on Balls Mahoney. I, I honestly, I know very little about him other than that he's a wrestler. He died very young, and he has one of the funniest names I've ever heard. But the only photo of him, he is bleeding from the forehead, and both of his wrists have been duct- covered in duct tape. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> anyway, that was, a, that was a little bit of fun for all of our wrestling fan listeners. You know, I've often said professional wrestling and ska are the only remaining forms of art in the world. I mean, um, there, are, there, there actually, there actually is, there is an argument for that. that is. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> it's an argument I'll make. <laughs> uh, this is behind the bastards. It's a podcast about bad people and also balls Mahoney, um, and about lying to the audience at the start of the introduction. Garrison, Margaret, how are you doing today? Uh, you know, I am um, all right. I spent all morning plumbing. Mm-hmm. And I haven't destroyed anything yet. That's good. I guess, it's, I guess it's my turn to talk. Um, yeah, that's generally how it works in a conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. I have my I mm-hmm. have my oat milk coffee. I'm ready ready to learn about wow. some some fascinating historical figures. Wow, who, you know, I just don't know. Your woke coffee. Yeah, I just don't know if we could have moved on if we didn't know what kind of milk you were using. Yeah, the wokest. So yeah, we would be judging you for any other milk. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how do y'all what do y'all what do y'all know about the Bavarian Illuminati? Oh uh, that's <gasps> that's something I've been that's something I've heard been screamed about <laughs> with megaphones <laughs> at like fascist rallies before. Yes. That is most most of the time I've most of the time that I've heard the words the Bavarian Illuminati. It's coming from some unhinged woman who has choice opinions about Jewish people. Um, yeah, yeah. Generally people generally the folks who feel strongest about the Bavarian Illuminati also have opinions about like the root races. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's not positive. No, no. Um, Margaret, do you know much about the Bavarian Illuminati? Or, the, or just okay, kind of secret society? Is that distinct society? from the regular Illuminati? Or is this a... It's the original like section? Illuminati. Ah. Unless you I once, believe the... Yeah. Mm-hmm. I once read a book about the origins of the Illuminati as influencing the anarchist movement called the Occult Origins of features. Anarchism or something. Uh, yeah. Features, oh, features of, anarchism. of Anarchism. Great book. So yeah, that nice is the sum of my knowledge is little that book. someone said that there's a through line. There is a, there is a through line, and we're going to be talking about that today. This is going to be a bit of a weird one. I've been wanting to do this, uh, an episode on this matter, kind of ever since we started the podcast. Last year, we did a live show that touched on the Discordians and Operation Mindfuck, which is kind of the end point of this story. But telling it all really properly requires... Um, well, it took me about 16,500 words. Um, <laughs> so so we, so we should probably two-parter. dig right in. No, this will be a little more than a two-parter. But I think it's important, not okay. because, just by the way, in, in case you're listening here wondering, like, has Robert gone crazy? Is he going to start telling us about how the Illuminati have put machines in our teeth that talk to us when we sleep? Um, obviously, that's been done. We all have those machines in our teeth. But it has nothing to do with the Illuminati. No, the Illuminati, the original Illuminati, are not particularly bad guys. They are they are people who made some some choices that have wound up carrying down through the ages in an unexpected way, and a lot of that's been negative. We're getting behind the bastards in this one in that, like, what we're all talking about today, the story that begins in Europe in, like, the 1700s, leads directly to QAnon, right? It leads directly to every aspect of modern conspiracy culture because the Illuminati are what create the first, like, uber conspiracy. You know, the first conspiracy that loops in all of the other conspiracies. The way that it all works now, right? Where if you believe that, like, 
if you believe that like the government is trying to keep you from drinking raw milk uh, or force vaccines on you to poison you, or if you believe that there are lizards at the center of the world, or if you believe that, uh, you know, the, 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 the elite are drinking the blood of children, you can, all of those can become part of the same conspiracy. And, and, and in fact, generally are because of the way that how the syncretic nature of modern like uber conspiracies and this all starts with the illuminati um they don't do it on purpose but they do kind of cause it by recklessness and so we're going to start by talking about the illuminati but actually we're going to start a long ass time earlier than that margaret uh and garrison because (laughs) how long how long would you guess like secret societies have been a major factor in like human civilization since before civilization. I mean, that is for a long, long, long time. Like, yeah, I I was surprised looking at this, how far back the research on this goes, Um, because it's it's as Margaret said, it's it's pre civilization. Uh, And in fact, a good example of like one of the first secret societies we have any kind of decent evidence of uh, comes from the Chumash people who have lived on the California coast and around that area for about 15,000 years or so. Obviously, you're never going to get an exact date on there, but at least like 15,000 years. Um, and starting at around 6,000 BCE, give or take a couple of centuries, they started <laughs> making really good canoes, which came to be known as tomals. And these craft, they like, you know, they got better and better at making canoes over time and kind of reached their most advanced, perfected form at around 1300 years ago. And this was a really involved process. They have all of these different pieces that allow them to be like tamoles are generally considered to be maybe the best canoes that existed before, like really modern materials. Um, And they're ingenious devices. And obviously they took a lot of experimentation and development in order for people to like figure out how to make them the best way. They're made out of redwoods. They're glued together with tar. They used shark skin as sandpaper, uh, which I didn't realize Mm. you could do, but 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 kind of make but makes sense. Um, And because these were so good, the task of making one took about 500 ish days if you were like a skilled manufacturer. And it required specialized knowledge that's kind of like about on the level of what it would take to be like a good auto mechanic. So that knowledge was valuable because as the, the people on the coast started making these tamoles and and getting better at them, it became like hugely advantageous to have one, both in in military terms, because they could allow you to raid your enemies really effectively. And they could allow you to fish and to trade a lot better. There was a lot of, of, you know, money or resources, at least locked up and having access to these things. And the people who made them realized, like, we have this knowledge that's not widespread. And if we keep it secret just amongst ourselves, then we can build a lot of power and wealth for ourselves and our families. Um, yeah, that the term that it, yeah, exactly. The Brotherhood of the Tamol, of Tamol held a, a pretty more or less a monopoly over the creation and piloting of these craft for we i mean we'll never know exactly how long but for an extremely long time um and this allowed them to become quite comfortable themselves a passage from the book first peoples populating the planet charts out how things went from there a bearskin cape worn only by the elite of canoe owners and village chiefs marked the beginnings of class distinctions as did burials which were far more elaborate for the wealthy and their children than for commoners members of the brotherhood of tamol were often buried with parts of their canoes Perhaps most offensive to the egalitarian and independent Juhuansi, who were neighbors to the uh, the Chumash, would have been the emergence of a permanent and hereditary political elite among the Chumash. High-ranking Chumash chiefs, who inherited their positions through the male line, exercised control over a number of communities, but each village also had its own chief, some of whom were women. These political leaders, all of whom were also canoe owners, led their people in war, presided over religious rituals, and regulated the flourishing trade that followed the invention of the Tamol. And... I find that fascinating, the idea that among this this society, class distinctions emerged as a result of the creation of this and, and the kind of the, the, sequ- the, the sequestering of this knowledge among an elite mm-hmm. chunk of the population. Um, I hadn't really thought about it occurring that way, but it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. No, as, 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 as soon as you mentioned that, that, they, that they specifically kept the information about how to make them secluded, I'm like, but on, on one hand, like, undeniably secret societies are kind of cool like everybody wants to be in the in-group everyone wants to have access to secret knowledge on the other hand just the existence of that will by itself create like conditions of inequality and goes against like ideals of like 
open access to information and how everyone should have the opportunity to learn anything that they can. Yeah. And it, it, it yeah, but that does create a very interesting, interesting dynamic. And, uh, but you yeah, can also it, use the same thing to keep information going that would otherwise be lost, especially absolutely. when you're talking about sure. people who don't yeah. know don't have writing systems or have different types of writing systems like oral tradition stuff being yeah, able to yeah. preserve information in it because because of your because of how sacred it is yeah right. yeah so and it's i mean not it, just gatekeeping it's also preservation yeah yeah and i, I don't want to be preserved i'm not like saying the brother of the tamal are the first <laughs> bastards or anything They're it's canceled. much yeah it's all obviously this is all we're taught these are these this is like a, a complicated thing and it had positive and negative impacts it's just it's it, it's fascinating to me, and it's going to be interesting how many things from as far back as the existence of the Brotherhood of the Tamil carry through to like modern day secret societies and in, in, in weirdly specific ways. But I, I, it's one of those things I kind of wonder. Obviously, we don't have a lot of written records from the people, the Chumash people in like 5000 BC or whatever, 4000, 3000 BC. But I kind of wonder like were there conspiracy theories about the the canoe people in their secret society running things like because that's a thing people do you know yeah, it's interesting yeah. no totally and what it, cuz it's kind of like you could almost imagine people talking about this like people today talk about like the free energy suppression conspiracy theory like mm-hmm. Donald Trump knows that like the someone's keeping free energy from american people for the like yeah it's uh i wonder like if we use I wonder. magnets to <laughs> yeah. when we spin something but with magnets Mm-hmm. More more em- energy comes out than goes in. That's right. That's right. That's why I throw magnets on the side of my car. Improve the gas yeah. mileage. One of these days, it's going to work. So, secret that's societies why ICP were... doesn't want you to know how they work. <laughs> yeah, they are the secret gatekeepers of all uh, of all <laughs> knowledge. They're the the brotherhood yeah. of the tamal of the modern era. <laughs> Um, so one of the things as I was reading about these guys that I found out that I hadn't realized is that there's actually like a really strong vein of research by anthropologists into the existence of secret societies across all of Neolithic humanity. This is a thing we do everywhere. There are people. Um, and it's, it's a thing that occurs in societies when they hit what's often described as kind of a middle level of development between wandering bands of hunter gatherers. And like, we're talking bands here, not like large moving, like tribes of people. Um, and then like what we broadly call ancient, like pre civilization where you have some settled communities maybe, but you at least have much larger groups of people moving and interact, even, even if they're still kind of nomadic. Um, and it's kind of in that, that inner stittle period between sort of like groups of, I don't know, 10 people wandering around the wilderness to actually starting to make towns and cities that you see the development of uh, of, of ancient uh, secret societies. In a lot of cases, like the American Pacific Northwest, well, what is today the American Pacific Northwest? Uh, it was common for adults to pick societies based on their talents uh, and most common vocation. And one of the things that this did is societies existed often across tribal and family lines. So in addition for being a way for people to kind of gatekeep knowledge and, and sort of build wealth between within communities and uh, along like lines of family descent, they provided a backdoor method of diplomacy and allowed for different tribes that might have often been in conflict over stuff like hunting grounds and other resources to also have a way in times of disaster to cooperate on something that sort of approached the level that a nation state could do it. Because you have, you know, maybe sometimes one tribe is fighting the other, but all of the people who know how to make this important thing have some sort of, like, occasionally will meet and engage in these secret religious observances together and talk shop and talk trade. And when a disaster hits, they're able to communicate with each other because they have this kind of this kind of brotherhood. Um, now, when anthropologists use the term secret to s- refer to these these secret societies, which are often called like guilds and groups, uh, that's mm-hmm. because all of these societies tended to enforce the isolation of their members for periods of time. That's what they mean by secret. It's not that like no one knew the Brotherhood of Tamal existed. It's that part of the way it worked is members would sequester themselves away from everyone else and have conversations and engage in rituals that other people were not allowed to see. Um, Some of these rituals would have been mystical. Some of them would have been doggedly mechanical, like instruction on the best way to make canoes. But all of them were secret. Many Neolithic peoples also practiced matrilineal descent. Um, So one way in which, uh, one very prominent way in which secret societies developed was because it was traditional for men to move in with the family of their partner. 
um, mm-hmm. which was not just an emotionally complex experience, but also led presumably to a lot of like frustration on behalf of some of these men. Um, and so secret societies were often very male dominated and it's o- just like, like a frat away. club. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a way for them to blow off steam. Right. <laughs> no, but in a pretty literal way, right. We're yeah. like we're fraternal, fraternal mm-hmm. societies that became frats. Yeah come out of all of this and actually like mutual aid organizations and yeah, shit yeah, come we are, out of all of this. We will be building to that. Uh, it's just interesting cool. to me how deep I'm it really goes. into this shit. So I'm really yeah, excited yeah, to yeah. about it. Yeah. That's why I, I, I wanted you yeah. on this. <laughs> so I want to quote, read a quote now from an American anthropologist named Walter Goldschmidt. There is always a magico religious aspect to such groups. They are characterized by ritual induction or initiations, by secret rites and ceremonies, and by a system of mythological justification. Often they also have a power function, uniting the senior men, the adults, or some especially selected group as against the women and children or all outsiders. Occasionally, there are countervailing women's organizations. And that's that's also it's interesting to be how deep like you you can see shades of this in like some of the weird incel communities online yeah. and like fucking andrew tate's little way. clubhouse it's so weird to me yeah. how far back this shit goes <laughs> well and it's this perceived uh, lack of power us men don't right. have any power yeah. they're saying yeah huh yeah interesting huh so <laughs> many ancient societies were either made of high status individuals or became that over time as their coordination allowed them to marshal resources more effectively than other segments of society and so secret societies they drove stratification and created it but they also kind of resulted from stratification it's it's obviously it's this is a very complex topic so it's not just one or the other Secret religious societies or cults were ubiquitous during the late period of the Roman Empire as well, and the early empire. In this case, they offered places for the elite to socialize and organize out of public view. And in fact, our modern term for cult was initially applied to different like religious sects, right? A cult was not, oh, you've you've fallen in with some weird charismatic guy. It's like, yeah, we decided to worship this goddess from Egypt who it, it became suddenly hip like in Rome to to worship this <laughs> goddess. You know, she's foreign and different. So like all the cool kids are in this cult now. And it's like wow, just a thing that we do together. Wow, they're, <laughs> wow, they're just like me. <laughs> yeah, Garrison, you would have you would have gotten on quite well. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting to me. In the long history of European secret societies, the most infamous before the Illuminati was probably the Order of the Temple of Solomon, better known today as the Knights Templar. Initially founded by veterans of the First Crusade, this was an organization of lay people who took monastic vows, and like the first thing that they did was basically act to protect as kind of in a, a policing manner, pilgrim routes of the Levant, right? So you've got these pilgrims heading forward to the newly reconquered Holy Land during the brief period that it was reconquered. And, <laughs> you know, there's bandits and shit. So the Knights Templar are kind of volunteering to um, to aid the, the transit of pilgrims by, by helping to protect them. Um, they also had a regular army and would fight in battle at periods of time as a regular army. Over time, in that way that you do, the Crusades went less well. There was much less call for Templars out in the Holy Land. And so they got into banking and became deeply woven into life across much of Europe. This disturbed traditional elites like King uh, French King Philip IV. And in 1307, the order was Purged in a, 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 you know, you'd call it an orgy of violence. It was a pretty, pretty solid mm-hmm. violence orgy. Um, and it was like about the mi- calling them Satanists or something because they. Oh yeah, this where, like, they're a lot always of the Satanists. Words for demons come from or something like Baphomet uh, that, or something. There's, a, I think that's a part of it. There's a lot of things happening at once that kind of okay. feed into it. But yeah, the, the Templars get accused of devil worship and accused of plotting for the overthrow of governments and trying to like make themselves the, you know, the like overthrow kind of the the settled power in Europe, um, them which of there's not really any evidence of. Yeah. Yeah. They're okay. really just they're really just like the ancient Bank of America, maybe more like an ancient credit union. Um, but yeah, it is your credit union with like a military. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Pr- primarily enacts like racist violence. I mean, eh, all modern banks, everyone, have the same. Garrison, everyone, states. every, that's, that's everyone true, with true. a military primarily enacts racist violence in this period of time. <laughs> <laughs> They're not really different from the French in that regard. <laughs> 
So during the mid 1600s, Europe experienced a rather sudden burst of religious creativity. The overwhelming control of the Catholic Church splintered uh, and suddenly you get your Lutherans and your Calvinists and all these all these Protestants start popping up all over the fucking place. This coincided with what's called the Age of Enlightenment, which by the 1700s is in full swing, bringing a newfound understanding of the scientific method and the value of rationality over dogma. Obviously, broad terms like the Age of Enlightenment exist to describe complex periods in very simple and very broad terms. The so-called Enlightenment was not evenly distributed, and it arrived, I think, a little later in Bavaria, because Bavaria stays extremely Catholic, which is in contrast to much of the rest of what we now call Germany. Uh, but when it did hit, the term that gets used in the area is uh, Aufklärung, um, which I think just means Age of Enlightenment, but in, in that silly language people speak in Bavaria. Is Bavaria, Bavaria is again, southern Germany? I believe so, yeah. It's, a, it's like the most conservative and the most Catholic part of Germany. Okay. Um, Which is yeah, the part that didn't vote for the south, Nazis. I think it, yeah, it borders Austria, because that's where Hitler oh, finds okay, himself so when he okay. leads his home in, in Austria. Well, yeah, east and, I mean, it, it is pretty, Southeast. a lot of okay. south, too. Um, I was just trying to position myself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it like borders. So, yeah, it, it, it's it, it borders uh, like Liechtenstein, Austria, all that good shit. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting part of Germany for that. And it's going to be a lot more conservative than than the rest of the area. So the Enlightenment's going to hit it in kind of a more controversial way. And I want to quote now from an Italian sociologist named Massimo Introvin. The Bavaria of the second half of the 18th century, a Catholic duchy, the duke's elector would take the title of kings only in 1805, and a predominantly Protestant Germany, was where in Europe the spirit of the Catholic Reformation and the Baroque age was best preserved. Education and culture were dominated by the Society of Jesus, and the former Jesuits remained influential even after the papal suppression of their order in 1773. The dukes resisted the reforms initiated in the neighboring Austria, although the latter was also Catholic, and the influence of the Catholic Church remained pervasive. Invasive. Trying to preserve this situation, the Catholic Church erected a barrier against the Enlightenment. Many books by Enlightenment philosophers, which circulated freely in the rest of Germany, were banned in Bavaria. The Protestant against the Catholic Church and the Dukes happened the protest against the Catholic Church and the Dukes happened mostly in the universities, where a number of professors were sensitive to Enlightenment ideas. In turn, students often kept in contact, particularly through the college fraternities that at this time began to gain importance with their colleagues in the Protestant German states. So Bavaria is kind of Florida, right? Like <laughs> they're very Hor much in Hor horrifying sentence. Thinking of yeah. the Florida Illuminati being yeah. like the next, like <laughs> in, in like in like fifteen hundred years, this conspiracy, about, this conspiracy is about the Florida Illuminati. Terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Florida Illuminati is like two guys with a single history textbook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but that's that is very much kind of what's happening here, right? There's this there's this pr progressive, you know, left wing and right wing. Those terms are, I think, kind of useless when we're talking about the situation in Europe in this period of time. Yeah. But it's certainly like a very progressive and secular wave sweeping a lot of the rest of Germany. But Bavaria is like rebelling against it. And one of the ways they do it is by banning books and cracking down. And one of the ways in which educated elites fight back and push Enlightenment values is through these little fraternities, these secret societies. Now, it is kind of worth noting because we've just talked about how it's sort of the Florida of Europe. Bavaria does produce some of the most creative thinkers of the whole Enlightenment, including Adam Leibniz, uh, who independently discovered calculus alongside Isaac Newton. Um, and then they had they had a little bit of a falling out with each other. He's also a wizard, which is cool. But so is everybody who does anything cool with science <laughs> so in this period Isaac of time. So is Isaac Newton. So is Isaac Newton. They're both wizards. They're wizards who used to be friends and then fell out over calculus. Many such um, cases. <laughs> I feel like it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> On February 6th, 1748, 32 years after Leibniz's discovery of uh, calculus, a baby boy named Adam Weishaupt is born uh, or it comes into the world um now his parents wait, have been wait, born wait. Is yeah he wait he's not actually does he come into the world what are you <laughs> okay you know what i mean <laughs> did, did you just like pop out what is <laughs> well i mean yeah garrison uh, probably yeah okay. when two cabbages yeah. love each other very much 
Yeah, I, I, I drew a diagram for you about this the other day. Um, oh, okay, great. Yeah, you can you can you can refer Sophie to vetoed that. giving it to you. Garrison. You can you can refer to that book of worm impregnation fetish pornography oh, that yes, I sent yes. you last night. Okay, that's got it. that's most of the basics. Twitter can help you out with the rest. Got it. All right, <laughs> will do. Um, so Adam Weishaupt comes into the world. Um, is born. Whatever. Uh, and yeah, a little baby in his, it's, he's in an interesting situation. He comes from kind of the upper class. His family has a decent amount of money. His parents were, had been born and raised as Orthodox Jews. Um, but they had decided to convert to capitalism or to a Catholic Catholicism. Oops. A little bit of a slip of the tongue there. Um, they, they become Catholics because like, it's a lot easier to be Catholic in Bavaria than it is to be an Orthodox Jew, right? That makes that, sense. That, 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 yeah, that, that, that should not surprise anybody. Yeah. Uh, and to, because they're kind of like, we should probably make as clean a break from our past as possible. Adam's parents enrolled him in a school uh, that was held, like run by a monastery as soon as he could walk. So he's taught by monks. Now, he has a childhood that's, I don't think, a, it's not an abnormal amount of turbulent for a kid in the mid-1700s. His dad dies when he's just five, and since single moms, that's not an encouraged thing, uh, especially if you have any kind of, like, money in this period of time. His mm -hmm. dad's co-worker at the University of Ingolstadt, where he was born, moves Adam into his household and takes him out of the monastery school and sends him to one run by Jesuits. And, mm -hmm. um, boy howdy, talking about Jesuits... That's going to take a second. Uh, so why don't we first talk about some products and services? The Jesuit Society would like to appreciate you for listening to this podcast. And mm -hmm. if you would like to join us, then you can find us at... That's the Jesuit ad. That's the I, Jesuit you ad. Just stop, yeah. and then the first thing that comes up is, Get your gold! <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> We're back, and we're we're thinking about the Jesuits. Now, when I was a kid, there was a Jesuit school uh, called Jesuit right next to my school, and it was where the rich kids went to school, or at least the rich kids who it were Catholic. It was called Jesuit? Yeah, yeah, it's called Jesuit. Okay. The big one yeah. in Portland is also just called Jesuit. Yeah. Well, that's and it was, I don't like, know if this a is... Very, this. That's very Jesuit in concept to just... Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Now, I don't know if it's the same in other with other Jesuit schools, but in the Dallas area, those were the kids you bought drugs from, right? Because they got <laughs> they got the cash. Their parents are, are too busy to really pay any attention. The Jesuit boys were, you know, that's where you get your weed. It's where you get your acid. You know, when you're when you're young, um, it's probably where you get your fentanyl today. You 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 Gen Z kids and your fentanyl. Um Anyway, at this point in time, I don't know if the Jesuits have access to much fentanyl, but they are something of a secret society. And they've been like they're all of the these Jesuits are like kind of members of an order that's been banned. So they're technically officially not Jesuits anymore because the Catholic cooler. Church. It does yeah, it, it is cooler. cooler. There's a there's so many conspiracy theories about the fucking Jesuits. But like, I think the best way to describe them is nerdy Catholics. Like yeah. their job, like the thing they're supposed to do is make more people Catholics and also learn and teach. Um, so there's a lot of Jesuit schools. They are historically pretty good schools. Um, and yeah, anyway, it, they're also, again, the, at the center of quite a few conspiracy theories. So because he's got the benefit of this Jesuit education, Adam is going to learn at a level that's kind of a lot beyond what most boys in that place and time could expect. And he takes to it like a duck to, you know, the thing that ducks do. Um, um, quacking? No, 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 much worse than that. Anyway, Wait, by the time, yes, exactly, Garrison. Okay. By the time he was an adolescent, he spoke German, Czech, and Hebrew fluently, and he quickly okay, okay, thereafter... Buddy. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, Good he's, for you. Yeah, yeah, he learns ancient Greek, Latin, and Jesus Italian Christ. next. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he is insufferable. Yeah. Um, he gets admitted to, age, uh, to university at age 15, okay. which is... Yeah, yeah, he's one of those kids. You know, uh, he's pushed I, down I went, the stairs I, a lot. I, I he should have been school at age fifteen, but I don't go around bragging about it on podcasts. Jesus. Yeah, you don't speak ancient <laughs> Greek either, Garrison. Yeah, I'm I'm learning. I'm trying because mm -hmm. I, I I I need I need to get a lot better with my Greek for the Greek now, magical papyri stuff, and it's 
hard because all of the all of the all of like the consonants sound weird. But anyway, uh, yes, continue. Yeah, they, they say everything. All I learned wrong. was um, how to say spanakopita horastiri. That's good. Uh, spanakopita without cheese. That was all I needed to get by in Greece. Hot. Was to mm-hmm. order vegan spanakopita. Love that. Now. Here's a question for you, Garrison. You're getting you're getting your PhD in magic shit right now from that from that online school that I heart among, paid for. Among other magic <laughs> things that I'm working uh-huh. on, yes. Sure. How close are you to that PhD, buddy? I'll get it within the year. You get it within a year. Well, honest, that's honestly, I, other <laughs> uh, I've 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 had I've had other developments in my magical study that is slightly more impressive and reputable than that school. So mm-hmm. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, well, if you don't finish it within the next few months, Garrison, then you'll get your PhD much later than Adam Weishaupt because he gets his doctorate five years later at age twenty. So I can, clock's ticking. I, I can still clock's I, ticking. I, I can still get it by age twenty. I can. I can do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you bet. You better move fast. <laughs> <laughs> so he spends his teenage years buried in books at the University of Ingolstadt's massive library, which has forty two hundred books. Now, for a bit of perspective, I that's have more like than half all of that Florida. <laughs> yeah, that's more than all of Florida. Well, it is. It is now after they banned all the books. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, the, that's what I'm. Okay, yeah, that's a it. lot of books for Florida. I just I find it interesting. Like the difference in what a lot of books was in, you know, this period of yeah. time, the late yeah. 1700s, kind of the start of the print era. And like, like, for example, today, the Internet Archive has two million modern books and more than 36 million books and texts. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's just that's kind of neat. That's a neat achievement, although, although a lot of those books are trash. So but they yeah. were trash back then, probably, too, a lot of the time. Anyway. Adam's a a big reader, very smart kid. He becomes enthralled with a lot of Enlightenment ideas and a lot of Enlightenment philosophies, as much as he can access while it's sort of banned in his area. Mm -hmm. Now, he does very well at the school. He gets promoted as soon as he graduates, basically, to assistant instructor to the chair of canon law. Um, And while I don't really know what that job would entail, and I don't care to learn, Adam was the first non-Jesuit to hold it in a century. Um, this does not go over well with the Jesuits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are okay. not thrilled about this. <laughs> and I'm going to quote next from a book by the Charles River editors. This prompted a stir of furrowing brows within the Jesuit community. Still, Adam's hot streak was anything but over. In 1775, when the 27-year-old was made dean of the faculty of law, the Jesuits sputtered their drinks and slammed their fists on their tables. The Jesuits had had enough. They barged into the university boardroom and demanded Adam's paycheck be withheld until he complied with the university's principles. So, you know, that's uh, not going to go well for them. Um, Adam, they accused him of uh, basically promoting off the uh, the Enlightenment, and teaching banned topics uh, that, like, different uh, Enlightenment philosophers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's talking about <laughs> secularism, the idea that maybe the Catholic Church shouldn't run everything. They don't like this. Um <laughs> And this pisses off Adam, right? The fact that he's he's having to fight against these kind of regressive Jesuits and their attitudes towards religion, it really pisses him off. Um, and whenever he would come across a bump on the road, across like some sort of stumbling block that was put up by these, these old-timey monk-type assholes, he would think back to the words of one of his favorite philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, one quote in particular stood out to him. The only practice that one ought to teach children is that they said ne- should never submit uh, which is, you know, that's based. Uh, yeah, yeah. Youth. Uh, Adam Weishaupt says youth liberation. <laughs> based, based, based youth liberationist. Yeah, you should hear this guy's attitude on bedtime discourse. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta so, go. <laughs> <laughs> Some of Adam's colleagues who were too frightened to stand up for him against the Jesuits, but who were sympathetic to his aims, reached out to tell him like, hey man, I know you're dealing with this secret society who are being real assholes. There's another secret society you might want to join because they can give you some some support in your fight against the Jesuits. And that secret society was the Freemasons. Now... Mm. 
People talk a lot about the Freemasons. Sure do. Um, they should. They sure do. They were. They will never stop. <laughs> at, at, at its core, the Masons are exactly like the secret societies we started this episode talking about. These kind of Neolithic organizations. It's like it's right. like a guild. Yeah. Yeah, it's a guild. Right yeah. down to the fact that a big part, one of the big things about the Brotherhood of the Tamol is that you you get these very nice, elaborate funerals. A big thing that the Masons provided was like life insurance that came with burial benefits for Masons. Like that was a major reason to join the masons there's also it was a big part of it is for all that like people talk about the rituals and and the magic stuff a huge part of it is like their members are mostly middle class and like upper middle class professionals and if you're a mason you get like a 10 percent discount at all mason affiliated stores so it's like so it's just like a yeah it's it's like it's it's a lot like triple a it's like yeah. AAA and kind of like USAA, where it's like you get discounted life insurance that's a lot harder for people who aren't in this organization to get. Um, it's and the very much like with AAA are really cool too. <laughs> yes, they are. They are. Uh, I had to actually <laughs> sacrifice a goat to get them to jump my car the other week. Um, yeah. Yeah. Imagine, uh, imagine in, in 500 years, this conspiracy is about AAA, the secret, <laughs> the secret group that's, mm-hmm. that's running the AI dystopia. Well, in a hundred years, we'll have forgotten the secret of electricity. So the, their ability to jump cars will just seem like magic. <laughs> Pure <laughs> esoteric knowledge. <laughs> Somebody, somebody finds like an old AAA car that has like yeah. the 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 fucking uh, maintenance handbook for a Toyota Corolla. You start yeah. to worship it. The sacred text. <laughs> it must be passed down through the lineages. You arise through the order, unlock new passages of the manual. Just a thousand people sitting in front of an old Toyota, and you do that thing where you like turn the key slightly and open the door, so it starts yeah. making that sound. And they all just hum. That's the ohm of the future. <laughs> Meditate to the sound of the car alarm. <laughs> Back then, they could figure out how to navigate the bureaucracy from when they moved from one region to another to join a different sect of the AAA. <laughs> so, all right. The Freemasons were not an old organization at the time Adam was advised to join them. They had started in kind of, and they, we don't know exactly when they start because there's actually not ever going to be an exact date for when they started because they emerge out of a bunch of different kind of independent groups that are all sort of similar in the early 1700s. It and was by like the very time, organic. It wasn't. Yeah, yes, like, yes, yes. There's all these independent groups doing the same thing. And I think in 1715 and like, I believe it was Scotland is the first time like a bunch of them all kind of merge together and say like, Hey, we're going to be the Freemasons. But yeah, it's a, it's a very, as you said, it's a very organic process. Um, and by the late 1700s, they'd spread from, from the Isles down to Bavaria and Adam decides, okay, I'll dip my toes in masonry. I would like some backup against these weirdo Jesuit fucks. Um, and he, he does a little bit of Mason stuff, but he's kind of turned off by all the, all their weirdo occult rituals. Yeah. He is like, I want to share and trade in band knowledge. And you guys are like dressing like sultans and tapping each other with toy swords on the shoulder. Um, <laughs> like a, a lot of Mason rituals are like racist costumes and silly little plates. Um, yeah. You can go to muse- You can go to Mason museums. There's one in Los Angeles that's really interesting, and you can see their silly little outfits. It's like high school theater grade level of construction, and I assume it was not much different back in the 1700s. If um, you try to buy old swords, some of the only swords from the 19th yeah. century that are available are some of the Mason swords, and they mm-hmm. look like fucking Renfair garbage. Yeah, they look like shit. Yeah, terrible swords from the fucking Masons. Now I'm, yeah. I'm sorry um, for all this Mason slander. If any Masons yeah. are out there feel free to hit me up yes i will join <laughs> oh i i could have joined at one point my grandpa was a mason but it seemed like a complete waste of time <laughs> um i don't know yeah hit us up masons um hit us up grand masonic conspiracy have I'm better so, swords and we can talk yeah i'm yeah I'm, I'm, I'm already a member of multiple secret societies i will be happy to add another one to the roster yeah um uh, great. So these rituals, in addition to being cringy, existed to provide the men there with a sense that what they were doing was hidden and separate from the regular world. And I want to read a quote from an anthropologist, Janet Burke, describing them. 
There is no question that the adoption lodge initiation rituals were designed to heighten dramatically the sense of friendship based on virtue among members. They contained all the consciousness-changing elements of traditional rites of passage found in many cultures throughout history. Each ceremony began with seclusion of the candidate in a reflection chamber. The main part of the initiation revolved around the imparting of knowledge, and it closed with integration into the larger group as a full-fledged member. Knowledgeable leaders imparted secrets, extracted oaths, and demanded humility. They employed strong, simple laden words and instruments and authority from a distant past. Candidates were required to pass through a series of degrees and master each before moving on towards the font of final knowledge, the perfection promised by the organization. Which was, again, a 10% discount at certain restaurants. Oh, it's so cool. It's amazing. It's so cool. It is really funny. It's like, when I go to the Arby's, I'm going to flash my Mason car. And get this. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what the Enlightenment is really for. If you want free meals, wear a Circle A, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. go to where go to one of those towns where every service class working person yeah. is an anarchist, and they'll I hook have, you up. I have joined a secret society that rules the world, and as the result, every fifth trip that I take to the Sizzler is free. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. Now, if you want to get free trips to the Sizzler, maybe that's what is being advertised next on our podcast. You don't know. It might be. Listen in, Sizzler heads. Garrison, have you ever been to the Sizzler? No. Second question, related. What's the most shrimp you've ever vomited up? <laughs> um, probably not much. Maybe like maybe oh. like five or six shrimps. Okay, Sophie, we're taking a work trip to the Sizzler. I'm down. <laughs> gotta, gotta pill Garrison on eating rancid shrimp at the Sizzler buffet. Oh, boy. (laughs) All right. The rest of you pill yourself on these ads. Ah, we're back. We're talking about times that we and our loved ones have all vomited at the Sizzler. Ah, nothing like a Sizzler parking lot for puking in front of like some family of four and like yeah. having these little kids just watch you hurl and and it's it's such a good time. There's nothing I love more than strangers children seeing me vomit out in public. It's it's a beautiful experience. See, See I'm surprised you didn't go for the outback with this bit. Oh, I vomited in many an outback parking lot. You see, puking is kind of my magic, and I'm very much exoteric uh, with that sort of thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm a vomit mage. <laughs> oh, uh, good stuff. I am. So, I am. I am not inviting you to the lodge. Just, I, we cannot afford the cleaning bill. We are very low on funds. That is a constant problem with secret societies. So Adam goes through this initiation ritual and he thinks it's kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> he basically, I have no idea what he's going to wind yeah. up doing. I assume he found the his, Illuminati. But. His, his issues are like, number one, he's like, these fucking Freemasons are too new. They pretend to be an ancient society, but they're not even 100 years old. Like, and it's it, they're making me spend a bunch of money on stupid costumes for this, like, bullshit. The other problem he has is that he, he feels like it's too accessible to the public. A lot of, like, regular people are Masons, like normal, yeah. you know, yeah. not, like, super poor generally, but, like, pretty normal dudes. And he's like... I want to tr- again. I want to trade in like forbidden knowledge. I don't. I don't want to be hanging out with the butcher that lives like four doors down. That's not a good secret society. <laughs> so he starts sketching out what he wants to do, and he, he he makes a plan to create a better secret society, a perfect secret society. And his plan is basically he wants to make an invisible web of what he calls wisdom schools that will promote the the molding of morals, scientific and human progress, and like. This uh, this belief he's come that he's come to that the the sort of acceptance of the scientific method over religious dogma is the path to happiness for the human race. That's that's what he wants to to spread, and he wants to spread it through the this like network of secret wisdom schools. So on May first, seventeen seventy six, twenty eight year old Adam Weishaupt founded the Covenant of Perfectibility, and again he's he's calling it that because the idea is we're going to perfect the human race through knowledge. And this After is the some only time, thing that happened in 1776. Yeah, yep. This that that's it's, it's famously the year where nothing occurred. 
Yeah. Um, by the fact that this happens in 1776 is going to become the core of about a million stupid conspiracies. Yeah, oh, Jesus. Yeah. What, what, yeah, what, yeah. what horrible timing. Horrible timing, Adam, <laughs> motherfucker. Pick a different year. Um, so he, he decides after a brief period of time that the Covenant of Perfectibility... Kind of a dog shit name. Stupid name, so, yeah. Stupid name. So he renames the society the Ordo Illuminati Bavarensis. Or in much, English, much the Order name. of the Bavarian Illuminati. Yeah, much better name. Is you gotta like, give it to him. This is why we do A-B testing. Yeah. Doesn't do, doesn't the Illuminati mean like the enlightened ones or something? We are. Yeah, we're talking about, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Kind of. There's a couple of debates. So Adam specifically picks it because of there was a Spanish organization called the Ilumbrados, um, which also means illuminated ones. Um, he also likes the French term Illuminés. There had been a, a number of s- little secret societies that had versions of that in their name. But his was the, Latin. The, his was Latin. And a part of why they're all using variants of illumina- of illuminated is that kind of in the Latin, it means more like spiritual and mental than it does like literally illuminating a space with light. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and he, he, he wants his, his interest here is not to create a mystic society. He is not super into like the weirdo ritual stuff, but he comes to the conclusion just based on his low opinion of the people around him that, quote, of all the means I know to lead men, the most effectual is a concealed mystery. So he decides he's going to wrap this network of schools in like a skin of um, the skin of a mystic organization because he thinks that will draw in more people and people who can fund what he's doing. From the beginning, he recognized that mostly men want a way to feel like they're special, somehow separate from the rest of their peers in the greater mass of humanity. Secret societies have always offered versions of this, but in the new modern age that was being built, a sense of connection to the mystic was more valued than ever. Adam's goal was to free society from the domination of cults like the Jesuits, uh, but to do it, he was going to have to create a cult himself. <laughs> <laughs> many, many such cases. <laughs> the only way to stop a bad cult with a weird religio-political hierarchy is a good cult. Um, Yeah, it's not going to work great. (laughs) So Adam starts talking with his colleagues at the University of Ingolstadt about his plans, and they all are on board. Because again, not much is happening in the late 1700s. One of the first people who kind of buys into his idea is an 18-year-old student named Anton von Massenhausen. Uh, And Anton suggests that he model the structure of his secret society off of college fraternities. Now, these are not the frats of the modern era entirely, which are based more around partying than other things. Um, But fraternity is kind of an enlightenment concept. It actually means something very important in this period of time. It's a codification, effectively, of the systems of mutual aid that had existed within secret societies forever. Like this concept of fraternity is like a buzzword that's going around at the time. Um, And it it kind of goes beyond just like simple concepts of community mutual aid. Famed sociologist E.J. Hobsbawm noted that societies like the Masons elicited a sense of fraternity in part due to the heightened alternate reality of secret religious ceremonies that they carried out. So basically some of the there's this sense of fraternity and part of how you inculcate that is by making people feel like they're they're privy to a like secret understanding of the world that everyone else doesn't have. The Which first is totally so, not how radical politics work. It's totally it's, it's, separate than when someone com- becomes an anarchist or a communist or if, joins anything else. Completely different. Yeah. Or a fascist for that matter. I know. Not the same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. maybe fascists do it, but definitely not the left. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. No one else. No one else. Yeah. Um, this is not effectively the same thought process that has no. made Twitter so fucking insufferable. Um, <laughs> completely different. So the first official meeting of the Illuminati consisted of Adam Weishaupt and four other dudes, all young students of law that Weishaupt had either tutored or just decided were good kids that he could kind of manipulate. <laughs> their first order of business was to create their own special symbol, a wreathed medallion featuring a wide-eyed owl. By the way, this is why there's a big owl at the uh, uh, the fucking, the, the, what is it, that gathering in the woods in Northern California that all the rich people go to? Um, Burning Met? No, wait, that's... No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, oh, the one that Bur- I don't actually know much about, because I'm... Yeah, you you could not call Burning Man a secret society. Yeah. Um, 
Although there's elements of this here. No, the uh, fucking... Um, I think I learned about it from your I'm, podcast, honestly. I can't believe I've forgotten <laughs> the fuck. Yeah, Bohemian Grove. <laughs> yeah, Bohemian Grove. Uh, yeah. It, but yeah, and Bohemia is not that far away from Bavaria. No, um, it sure isn't. It's very far away and from I, California. Not, not, yeah, probably. So, yeah, it, so one of the things that they do at the end of every Bohemian Grove, which is like all of the rich people, rich and powerful people go and party with Henry Kissinger for like a week and they stage ridiculous little plays and they carry out a ritual and kind of the crowning moment of it all is the cremation of care where they burn a 40 foot tall owl. Um, anyway, interesting how, 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 and again, this is part of where the conspiracies come from is that like a lot of this shit gets passed down for whatever reason this kind of image uh, of an owl um becomes you know as, as iconic as the mason's eye uh mm. glyphs that they would put in shit that like winds up on the u.s dollar and stuff um now in that first meeting the 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 at this point five member illuminati listed their objectives as to stimulate a human and sociable vision, support virtue where it may be threatened or oppressed by vice, to promote the progress of all people, and foster and benefit those deprived of education. Now, that sounds pretty nice. That's yeah, not a bad... Fun. Yeah, not a bad list of things to do. Yeah. Um, Adam additionally promised that he would protect his followers from persecution or oppression, and that he would tie the hands of any kind of despotism um, by building a society okay. that was capable of working between Amen. national lines. Yeah, his goal is to get as many intelligent and influential people to secretly join his Illuminati as possible so that they can kind of take over and manipulate the levers of power in Europe. Um, at the time he starts the Illuminati, Adam has moved beyond his simple desire to like support these Enlightenment attitudes that were pro-science and pro-religion, and he, he's gotten increasingly radical. He started toying with deism, and he kind of gets pilled on atheism and starts to believe that like not only is atheism a more rational way to look at the world, but we should we should push people in power in Europe who are atheists to kind of take more power away from the church. And you know what? It actually seems like this whole monarchy thing that we're doing across Europe is a bad idea, and maybe everything should be a republic. So he, this is when I talk about, like, okay. the, he's trying to push these secret values. What he's trying to push is, like, secularism and the idea that people get to vote. Um... Now, this is very like radical 1776 shit to me. <laughs> it is some 70, 1776 <laughs> shit. Um, so obviously, it's illegal for him to talk about this where he is living. Other parts of, you know, what becomes Germany, you can talk about this, but he cannot in Bavaria. So he borrows from the Masons and he creates a strictly tiered ranking system for the Illuminati. I'm going to quote from Massimo Introvin here again. Although it counted only five members, the order was already divided into an Areopagus, consisting of Weishaupt, Massenhausen, and another student, Max Mers, whose members knew the order was a brand new creation, and a circle of novices who were left to believe that the Illuminati had instead centuries of history, existed outside of Ingolstadt, and had mysterious leaders above the professor of law. So <laughs> well, the first decision he makes is we have to pretend we're like a thousand years old and across the world and that secretly rules. rule the world. That is where it starts. Like that the rules. Illuminati creates the Illuminati conspiracy theory so people won't think they're silly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to prove that you're not silly. <laughs> This is where it all begins. Weishaupt felt a need to hide the truth from his followers, which eventually extended to pretending the lawyer was much larger than it needed to be. Um, now, this was justified by the needs of secrecy, but mainly by the fact that what Adam's trying to push is extremely boring. The actual center levels of the Illuminati, when you like get through all of the not all of the initiations and gain all of the rank, there's no more rituals. He just hands you a couple of illegal books about like. Maybe it would be cool if the Catholic Church didn't run things. Like, that's the center of it. You get to the center of it, and it's like, you know it would be neat? Voting. Like, that, that's literally the core of the Illuminati's teachings. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's, like, um, it's, like build, it's like building this onion of protection exactly. and sec secrecy around that because this actually is illegal. Yeah, um, exactly. And I feel uh, like people might actually take a few notes here as not only more information gets made illegal like certain books or not being allowed to be shared in schools but also stuff like hrt and stuff like uh, uh, uh like access access to abortion stuff right as all these things get more and more illegal these types of secret society tactics 
get used again because they've been stuff they they've been things that we've been doing for a long long time yeah uh depending on the circumstances although in this case you might want to learn from some mistakes that they're about to make <laughs> so true. um yeah so um lower level members members are promised that all of these rituals they're doing all of this magic has this like central explanation that's revealed to higher level higher level members but adam has no no pl- like pre- plans of actually letting most people in on this because again it's really risky um so most of the plan is to kind of keep people uh, string them along doing the silly rituals and hoping that that keeps enough of them happy that like the cream will rise to the top so to speak i love the hypocrisy um, of that this is yeah, all about is. spreading enlightenment <laughs> and teaching yeah. people so we have to lie to these guys yeah <laughs> um it's also one of the reasons why they do this which is very practical and and smart but extremely funny is um i'm actually just going to quote again from uh in trophy in here The order counted on Bavarian provincial notables, indispensable for the dues they paid, but who had affiliated themselves uh, thinking of joining a kind of Freemasonry in small towns where either there was no Masonic Lodge or they did not know where to find them. They had vaguely heard of alchemy and secret rites and hoped that they would be revealed to them, while they would not be particularly interested in Baron de Holbach's anti-religious philosophy, even if it were revealed to them, which had of prudence it was not." Weishaupt's quasi-Masonic imitations were pedantic and uninspired. The answer he invariably gave to the disappointed was that, as in Freemasonry, in the Illuminati, the first three degrees were preparatory to further initiations, where the true ritual uh, mysteries would be revealed. So, (laughs) a big part of this is, I need rich people's money, and they want to pretend, they want to feel like they're alchemists. So I've got to, (laughs) like, I've got (laughs) to fake that. So we can fund the illegal book trade. Like, he's conning rich people out of money by convincing them they've become wizards in order to buy illegal books and trade them around Europe. I mean, I mean to all be right, fair, all this right, is, that sounds all right. That has also been that's kind of cool. Of, that's also been a core component of wizardry for a long mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. A, a big part of being a wizard is lying about alchemy and taking rich people's money. That's just like, oh, it's that. And that, that's the real getting, magic. It's, it's, it's that and then also getting sick and dying off of metal fumes being being boiled in like an uh, unventilated room those, those are the those are the two main components mm-hmm. of doing alchemy <laughs> see yeah. at least witchcraft they just sell us crystals mm-hmm. <laughs> see i want to go back to my favorite meme the the two guys from predator shaking hands and have it be wizards rednecks in the south with a backyard workshop inhaling metal fumes and getting a metal flume fever <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Margaret, you got anything to plug? Uh, yes. If you inhale books, mm-hmm. illegal books that mm-hmm. only the secret, if you can find where to purchase Escape from Insul Island, then you're on the in crowd. And I'll wow. give you a hint. It's a code, wow. tangledwilderness.org or wherever you purchase books. That's my most recent book. You can get it there. Or you can actually listen to several of us um, enact escaping from Incel Island. If you listen to the Strangers in the Tangled Wilderness podcast, there's a live play of a role-playing game based on um, based on my book, Escape from Incel Island. That's what I got. We all played it. It was really good. You also have a podcast on this very network. Oh, shit, I do. If you like cool people who did cool stuff and then you can find where to it's called cool people did cool stuff it's on cool zone media it comes out every monday and wednesday it's sort of the inverse of behind the bastards not that i would ever do anything unoriginal or derivative now if you really want to be a cool person who does cool stuff what you should do is weld galvanized steel without wearing any kind of mask or respirator yeah the zinc is good what the cool yes like the wizards do yeah (laughs) zinc is really positive um, mm-hmm. Well, you, you know, I, I see at the grocery store zinc pills. So clearly the most effective way to get zinc is Inhalation. to weld galvanized steel without a mask. When I used to be like really anxious and I was mm-hmm. doing jewelry work, I would like start freaking mm-hmm. out and calling like my doctor friend as soon as I like, I like soldered something that had some galvanized on it. And I was like, I'm about to die. Mm. Um, but then well, again, one of my metal worker friends did almost die from um, 
accidentally uh-huh. doing some shit yeah. to Galvanized. So, and, and, and that means he's in the coolest secret society of all. <sighs> so the, the ancient order of nearly killed my lungs by welding galvanized steel. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gary, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, sure. I uh, recently wrapped up a four-part series on the Defend the Atlanta Forest and Stop Cop City movement in Atlanta, Georgia. Hell yeah. That can be, that can be found on the It Could Happen Here podcast feed. Um, yeah, it's 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 four episodes. Uh, at this point, could probably binge all of them all in a row. Uh, yeah, it covers a lot of the stuff from the past the past few months and the, the recent killing of a, ple- of a of a forest defender by the Georgia State Patrol. So it's a... Uh, Kind of some, kind of some heavy stuff, but also talking about I think things that are important. You get to hear from people that are on the ground throughout the series. That is the that is the most recent kind of large project that I have that I've finished. Hell yeah, very cool. Um, almost as cool as inhaling metal fumes. Oh, so. I, I I will say, um, the, near like a a a a a few blocks away from the anarchist community center inside it inside atlanta there is a freemason building just 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 like right right down the street so that is a tunnel between them there is which one is a front for the other possibly possibly (laughs) almost certainly all right everybody come back next time when we will hear the exciting conclusion of the story of the bavarian illuminati and uh and eventually all of the other illuminatis that that come after it leading to QAnon and the probable destruction of Western civilization. Anyway, (laughs) have a good, have a nice day. (laughs) Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.